and welcome to Counterculture with Danielle D'Souza Gill. The culture's gone crazy, media's gone mad, and reason has become repugnant. Here, we focus on facts and how to fight back. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the recent Born Alive bill passed by the House, the bill condemning violence against pro-lifers, and we will also discuss the recent shooting that took place in California, as well as the rise of Asian hate crimes. The left is notoriously ill-equipped when it comes to defending their platform through arguments and debate. But for some reason, this deficiency has very little impact when it comes to the popularity of their ideas. Why is that? In their own minds, their constellation of beliefs are the product of a scientifically, morally, and logically superior understanding. That's why if you disagree with a leftist, you are factually wrong just plain evil, or both. There's no room for middle ground. You are either with them or you're against them. Leftists look down on all who disagree with them from their perch of attained enlightenment with a knee-jerk sense of disdain, and if it's a good day where they're feeling particularly generous, they may also add to that disdain the slightest tinge of pity. And yet, when called to defend these ideas which they hold to be obvious, no argument can be marshaled in their defense. Instead of logically coherent argumentation, you get some form of the most juvenile of rhetoric. You get, shut up. For example, if you engage in an argument over men competing in women's sports, you might point out that men and women are biologically different in terms of muscle mass, bone density, and the natural production of testosterone. Men have a great advantage over women in sports. To which the standard leftist response is to call you a bigot. You are insulting all those men who surgically and chemically disfigure themselves in order to compete in women's sports. In other words, shut up. That's not an argument. It barely qualifies as a retort. It does nothing to address the sound argument it purports to answer. But this failure to respond to the argument still wins in terms of popularity in the media because it paints the person making the logical case as some sort of hateful bigot. It exchanges a losing position in a debate for a winning position in a smear campaign by performing a first strike character assassination. Now, anyone trying to make the logical argument for limiting women's sports to only women is immediately lumped into the same category of transphobic. This rule is applied without exception. This is why there is a campaign to boycott an upcoming Harry Potter game in order to ensure that liberal feminist J.K. Rowling doesn't see a dime in new royalties. Rowling is not making the game and has had no input in its creation. Nonetheless, people on Twitter are claiming that if you purchase the game or try to popularize it, you are by definition transphobic. See how that works? We've skipped the debate and headed straight to name calling. One area where this tactic has been very successful has been in the question of abortion. Pro-lifers argue the baby is a helpless human being whose life should be protected. And the leftist? Their counterargument is shut up. Ever since the Dobbs decision in July of last year, leftists have consistently argued that by striking down the Roe v. Wade decision, SCOTUS has, quote, ended federal protections for abortion rights. But that's a wholesale lie. A right to abort one's child is nowhere to be found in the U.S. Constitution. Arguably, the Declaration of Independence prohibits abortion through its very preamble, where it guarantees us all the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Without life, first and foremost, all other rights aren't really worth enumerating. And even when Roe v. Wade was settled law, it did not establish a right to abortion. What it did was make any form of limitation of abortion extremely difficult to pass and uphold on a state level. This was true even in the case of outright infanticide of children born alive. When laws preventing this barbaric practice were passed, leftists would argue against it for infringing on a right that never existed. And that was in fact the argument recently made when the Republican House passed a federal version of this law. The law mandated the medical care for a child who survives the abortion process and makes it out of the womb. This law is rational. The idea it proposes is popular. Living human babies outside the womb, already born, shouldn't be left to starve to death or thrown alive into the trash to die from exposure. 
we can assume the number of people in the country who would not act to save the life of a baby who was in danger is in fact very small. As well, we can assume that anyone who chooses not to act would receive the universal condemnation of those who value innocent human life. And yet, 210 Democrats in the House voted against this measure. Democrats in the Senate likewise declared the bill a non-starter. Why? Because as Democrat Senator Chuck Schumer said, quote, American women deserve to have their right to health care protected, not undermined, end quote. Did Schumer give an argument stating why he was against giving a baby outside the womb health care? Did he say how saving the life of a baby has anything to do with women's health, a completely separate human being and body? Did he even have a personal anecdote saying why he personally could not support the idea? No, he disingenuinely inserts the lies that abortion is both a right and that it is health care. It doesn't matter that objectively abortion is the furthest thing from health care. It doesn't matter that there has never been a constitutional right to abortion. The idea isn't to win the argument, but to smear the arguers. The benefit of this tactic is that it's so simple, even a mainstream media talking head can do it. In discussing the passage of the bill, Andrea Mitchell of MSNBC corrected one of her network's own correspondents, chastising him for using the term pro-life to describe a Republican who was initially critical of the Born Alive bill. Mitchell told the correspondent that pro-life is a term, quote, that an entire group wants to use, but that is not an accurate description, end quote. Watch. If you will, for uh, Garrett, future, let me just, uh, future voters. Let me here. just interrupt and say that pro-life is a term that they may, that an entire group uh, wants to use, but that is uh, not an accurate description. I'm using it because that's the term she used to describe herself, I understand. Andrea. I understand. Anyway, that was her explanation. Isn't it cringeworthy to watch? See, the idea is not about ideas per se, but packaging. People who want to save the lives of babies aren't pro-life as much as they are anti-women's rights and healthcare. Mitchell was doing her part to limit any positive impact the right might enjoy by calling themselves pro-life and being pro-life. She understands this isn't a debate, but a mass public shaming. And so you have to wonder how many babies are going to endure this senseless brutality because of liars like Chuck Schumer and Andrea Mitchell. The argument in the media is that these cases are probably rare, but they don't know. Their own data omits New York, where it is in fact legal to murder a newborn survivor. Life News reports that in just seven states over the course of 2020 to 2022, there were 34 such instances. That's not an insignificant number when you're talking about the lives of otherwise viable newborns.